This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. One hundred African migrants still stranded off Italy's coast as the Interior Minister stands his ground. Afghanistan buries 63 victims killed in a wedding suicide bomb attack in Kabul. And thousands of protesters ignore a police order and spill beyond Hong Kong's Victoria Park in Sunday protests. Hello and welcome to Africa Live on CGTN with me, Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. Also coming up on the program. West Africa meets East Africa at the Afrobeat Music Festival in Uganda. And in your sport, South Africa appoints Enoch Nkwe as the team director to turn around the fading fortunes of the Proteus cricket team. We begin in the Afghan capital of Kabul, where burials have been taking place for the victims of a suicide bombing. The hit on a wedding party left 63 people dead and wounded 182 of others during the reception. The Islamic State claimed responsibility for the incident. Meanwhile, the Taliban condemned the attack and denied having any involvement in the hit that happened in a minority Shiite neighborhood. There have been continuous fighting and bomb attacks in Afghanistan over recent months despite talks between the United States and the Taliban since last year. President Ashraf Ghani has accused the Taliban of providing a platform for terrorists. We were at a wedding party and once again we witnessed a brutal act of barbaric people. A suicide bomber came and detonated himself among the people in the wedding party and caused grief to all families. The targeting of our people in such events like wedding parties, schools, mosques, markets, and public places indicates the atrocity of a terrorist group who is determined to kill the innocent people. Taliban cannot absolve themselves of blame, for they have provided a platform for terrorists. As a result of a terrorist attack on a wedding party, at least 63 of our compatriots who are civilians, including women and children, have been killed and 182 other civilians have been injured. In Sudan, the country's opposition coalition has named five people it has chosen as civilian members of the country's sovereign council who will be sworn in on Monday. The five people from the Forces of Freedom and Change will join another five to, named, to be named by the military. The two sides will then jointly choose an 11th member. There have been celebrations in Khartoum and other Sudanese towns after the final deal. The deal follows months of protests that rocked the country, leading to the overthrow of longtime leader Omar al-Bashir. Thousands of protesters have gathered outside the People's Liberation Army, Hong Kong Garrison Headquarters, and the Hong Kong Government Headquarters. Some of the demonstrators were filmed directing laser pointers at the two buildings. There are also reports that a man was attacked because protesters suspected he was from the mainland. Police had authorized the rally as long as it remained confined to the Victoria Park. But protesters ignored the order and poured into surrounding streets all the way to the central business district, leaving many roads paralyzed. Well, Chinese expatriates and students have held a rally in downtown London, calling for restoration of peace and order in Hong Kong. They gathered in Trafalgar Square on Sunday, waving China's flags and holding up signs saying, One Nation, One China. This is the second such rally held by Chinese nationals in London this weekend. This is what we want to against the violence, that's the most important thing. Because we need, uh, we think even uh, we have a different idea, but we need to do it in a non-violence way. And now what will happen in Hong Kong is definitely different from what we want to see. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of violence even to the innocent people and to the Hong Kong police. We, we, will, uh, we will not tolerate them. A tea shop owner in Hong Kong has become a target for online abuse when she put up a sign supporting the police. CGTN's Wang Hao tells us what happened. We support Hong Kong police. 
says the sign in this tea shop in Hong Kong. It provoked a flood of angry comments online, making the owner worried that her restaurant might be attacked. On social media, some people say they don't like the Hong Kong police, but why? So I said I support the police. I didn't think it would bring me trouble. I'm really scared, but because of that, I have to stand up. Because I know if I step back, those people who threaten me will become more fierce. The cafe has been here for 51 years. Li Huiwu took it over from her father. Business is not as good as before, and she worries it might not survive. So that she regret putting up the sign. I don't regret it. I'll do it again if I had to. Luckily for Li Huiwu, her neighbors are all willing to back her up. Because she was one person being bullied, we've come to help her. We'll help her as much as we can. There are only about 10 tables in the small tea shop, but it's full of customers. Many people come from far to have a simple meal, expressing their support for Li Hui Wu. We support her. She's brave. As a Chinese person, I hope I would do the same. Customers say they hope the chaos will end as soon as possible and life will get back to normal. This is also Li Hui Wu's wish. Wang Hao. CGTN. Over 100 migrants remain stranded on board a Spanish humanitarian ship waiting to be allowed to dock at the Sicilian island of Lampedusa. For days, the open arms vessel has been anchored about 300 yards off Lampedusa, with, while Italy's interior minister refuses to grant docking permission. 27 unaccompanied minors were allowed to leave the ship after a series of letters written by Premier Giuseppe Conte. However, the rest counted their 16th night while awaiting their fate. After days of waiting, at least four migrants wearing life vests jumped into the sea to try to swim to the Italian island, but they were later stopped and brought back. Now, while the government in Italy is toughening up on immigration, there are also some Italians who want to help those fleeing the horrors back in their home countries. A CGTN's Michelle Bad David reports from Milan. A group of doctors is working to support refugees who have endured unspeakable atrocities. 24 year old Mohammed lives in northern Italy. He escaped death in Libya but still carries the scars, both physical and psychological. So it's very hard, it's a very nightmare. Sometimes, sometimes I cannot sleep, I cannot even eat food. Even midnight, I cannot even, uh, I will just wake up in the midnight or maybe thinking about having some nightmare, what happened in my past and something like that. They want to cut Mohammed says militants tried to execute him in Libya. They were supposed to, they want to cut my head and I will use my hand to block. That's why my hand is like that. It's making my life difficult, like maybe if I want to do small things. Because of my hand, now, right now I cannot do. Dr. Massimo Del Bene is a plastic surgeon at the San Gerardo Hospital of Monza. Together with his colleagues, they operate on torture victims. He has operated on Mohammed three times. Normally, we treat cuts made by machetes where the hand is almost amputated, crush injuries, fractures made by hammer, lesions from fire from burns. They threw petrol on their hands and chest. Del Ben explains that treating torture injuries is challenging. It is the medieval surgery we're not accustomed to. We were trained for a type of urgent and immediate surgical plastic repair. We were not trained for wounds that are three to five years old. This is a big problem. For Dr. Del Bene, treating torture victims is not only about repairing deep physical injuries, it's also about giving his patients a second chance in life. I really have hope in, my, I have hope for myself, you understand? So like, maybe if, if it's about maybe 10 operations, if I like, I want to do it because I really need my arm, you know, I'm still young. Hundreds of refugees like Mohammed have been trying to escape the horrors in Libya every year. Around 700 people have reportedly died trying to cross the Mediterranean in the first half of this year. 
Since Italy's interior minister Matteo Salvini closed ports to migrants, many more are left with the decision to either stay or leave and risk dying at sea. Michal Bardavid, CGTN, Milan. You're watching Africa Live, still ahead on the program. We focus on the conservation of pangolins as stakeholders meet in Geneva over endangered species. And West Africa meets East Africa at the Afrobeat Music Festival in Uganda. Africa Live. Find your voice. The Economic Office of the Chinese Embassy in Conakry recently launched a training initiative for 50 Guinean executives on agricultural techniques and planning. Its, global is, its goal is to boost the Guinean agricultural sector. More details with CGTN's Ashtatao. Various executives from the Ministry of Agriculture, the private sector and local structures specializing in agricultural development are taking part in the training. During this time, they will learn good agricultural techniques, opening up of production areas, industrialization and processing of products. China and Guinea have the same problems. Despite the diversification of natural resources, China has experienced many difficulties. We found solutions as we went. This is why we saw a great development. The Guinean executives who are taking this training with me are interested in the causes, but also think to find a solution to the problems posed. The aim of the training is to boost the country's agricultural production. All the techniques applied by the Chinese from 1980 to the present day will also allow us to propel the agriculture of our country. So the Guinean government will no longer import rice. We can improve our production if our difficulties listed during this training are taken into account. If we add to this the Chinese experiences, Guinean agriculture will be better. The particularity of this training is that it takes place locally. This is new for participants. We believe that they will take advantage of the Chinese expertise in agriculture because the government attaches importance to agriculture. Guinean agriculture has important assets that offer many economic opportunities. Today, many farmers are self-reliant thanks to the country's vast land. All the needy who are around this arable plain can now find food. I thank the President of the Republic, Professor Alpha Conde, and ask him for the multiplication of such initiatives throughout the country. He must help us to open up the fields. Access is almost impossible. To speak of development, we must first achieve food security. As a mother, I encourage such initiatives. Foreign countries and partners must help us to value agriculture because it is the lever of development. However, the country still struggles to achieve food security and economic growth. According to studies, only 50% of its land is exploited because of lack of funding and poor agricultural techniques. Astatal, CGTN. Conservationists in South Africa are constantly working over time to rescue pangolins from the hands of poachers. Pangolins are the world's most trafficked mammals. As thousands of delegates gather in Geneva for the two-week meeting of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species or CITES, we look at the issue of pangolin poaching in South Africa. CGTN's Lisa Njamela reports. South Africa and the rest of the African continent continue to grapple with the blight of pangolin poaching. Despite the fact that the global wildlife trade regulator, CITES, banned the international trade of pangolin scales and meat, the illegal trade still flourishes. 
Pangolin numbers are dwindling at alarming rates in South Africa and across the globe. The future appears bleak for these small, relatively unknown creatures. Here in South Africa, conservationists are working towards ensuring that endangered animals are protected and that the few that have been rescued from traffickers are cared for. By August this year, 68.5 tons of pangolin scales were intercepted that left the shores of Africa. This equates to well over 100,000 African pangolins in less than nine months. The amount of pangolins uh, that are intercepted in the illegal trade here in South Africa has also climbed every single year. Um, last year there were 41 uh, pangolins seized from the uh, illegal trade in South Africa, live pangolins. It's increasing every year. It's um, as concerning as the rest of Africa, which is um, a whole-scale uh, industrial type of operation, poaching operation. Um, and our pangolins are leaving our continent um, by the ton load, and we are very, very concerned about it. Pangolins are elusive creatures, with three of the four African species only coming out at night. The number of these animals in the wild is not definitely known as their secretive nature makes them hard to track. Professor Ray Janssen is one of a number of conservationists who are at the forefront of fighting against pangolin poaching. We normally get involved with the South African Police Service, um, the Department of Environmental Affairs, in particular the Environmental Management Inspectorates, and we arrest these people. If we get the pangolins out of the trade and they've only been in the trade for a week or ten days, they generally do survive and we rehabilitate them and release them. Ones that have been in the trade for up to two weeks are, are in huge trouble. A lot of those who remain in the trade for long don't survive. Both Janssen and Wright believe education is key as one aspect of dealing with this scourge. Education and awareness, if we can turn people around to protecting the animal and a lot of communities throughout Africa actually revere the pangolin. It's one of their um, um, totem species that they hold in high reverence as a cultural emblem and a cultural and spiritual animal. Um, so we need to remind people about that. For them to take note of the problem, they've got to realize it's, it's a problem for the country. The people are going to, to lose um, a great asset and that is a huge buy-in which is very difficult sometimes to get awareness out there. The conference of the parties to the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species will explore a range of measures to strengthen conservation for pangolins. Your design Jamila for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. In Uganda, artists thrilled their fans at a concert dubbed East Meets West. The Afrobeat Festival, which is the first of its kind in Uganda, featured artists from Nigeria and the East African region. CGTN's Hilary Ayesiga reports. It's party time at Kampala's hockey grounds. Artists do their best to keep the fans entertained. They are dancing to the Afrobeat rhythm. It's such an amazing thing to see that Africans now want to like collaborate and do stuff together. And uh, I'm so happy to be part of it, you know. Yeah, I had an amazing time on stage. I can't wait to come back to Kampala. Revelers here are being treated to a mixture of music genres from West African dance styles to East African tunes. Organizers here hope to bring the two cultures together at this concert. The event also promotes creative art such as fashion wear and face painting among others. The main intention of East Meets West is not only uh, to look at musicians, we're basically looking at every African and every East African who is out there and they have talent. That's why we have it. we're having body painters, we're having people who are selling clothes, we're having so many things at the event. To keep the rhythm flowing, more artists get on stage. Together we stand, like, divided we fall. You get, um, this is my first time in Uganda. And it's amazing, I mean, it's, it's good because Africa is coming together. One sound, one music, like, we're doing, we're doing really good. The Afrofusion Festival is now an annual event. And as revelers groove the night away, they hope to bridge the two cultures through music and dance. Hilara Isga, CGTN, Kampala. 
and your sports news coming up next. Here's what's ahead. South Africa appoints Enoch Nkwe as the team director to turn around the fading fortunes of the Proteus cricket team. Nigeria is my home. 160 million vibrant, ambitious individuals constantly seeking the perfect self-expression. It is these people who inspired me to be that person that is seen, to be a voice that is heard, and ultimately to be the anchor that I am. I have to tap in, tune in, and turn on the very best qualities within me to deliver the news. I'm Richard Nta, an anchor for CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. We start off with cricket, where South Africa's cricket team is in the midst of change, and the retirement of some experienced players has brought new faces to the Proteus Test squad. Cricket South Africa also the asked also asked the traditional head coach role and opted for a team director in Okunque in a bold step for the sport desperately seeking to carve a new path and find success. Here's CGTN's CS Duplessis. Cricket South Africa named 36-year-old Enoch Nkwe as the interim team director for the tour to India in October. That includes three T20 internationals and three test matches. The former South African A-team assistant says he was surprised by the appointment but feels he is ready for the challenge and eager to prove himself. Yes, I didn't expect it to come so soon, but I've always, how I've always worked is to really stretch myself on a yearly basis to be to be in a position of uh, if an opportunity anywhere else or in a higher position um, comes along that you know I'm ready for that. Veteran skipper Faf Duplessis will lead the test team that sees the inclusion of three new caps and fast bowler Andrik Nokia, wicket keeper Rudy second and spinner Senaran Mudasami. While the experienced batsman Quinton de Kock will take on a new role as captain of the T20 side in what is the start of a new chapter and new direction for the national team. The focus is just for, for the Indian tour. Um, you know, we want, we want to make an impact, immediate impact um, on that series. Yes, it is going to be a tough one, but uh, there is, a, in the, you know, in the back of Korea Africa's mind that, you know, there is a big picture. The new man in charge says it is vital to establish a positive team environment ahead of a tough assignment on the subcontinent after a World Cup performance that left a lot to be desired and dented the overall confidence of the squad. I strongly believe that you know, every, every challenge is an opportunity, you know, for personally to, to thrive or the team to thrive, you know. So it's important that obviously us, you know, as, as, a, as a team management, we create that thriving environment as soon as possible. The changes could lead to a few teething problems as the new personnel find their feet. But despite that, a massive task lies ahead against arguably the best team in world cricket on Indian soil. The time for dwelling on the past is long gone as business resumes. Players picked will need to prove themselves and do so quickly if they're to be a part of the new direction cricket is moving in. CS Duplessis, CGTN, Johannesburg. On to rugby and South Africa have booked their place at the 